we give them a warm welcome? Because they're up here and they're awesome and we love them. <laughs> okay, guys. Number one, this question goes to Stephanie and Pam. So we'll start with Stephanie. How do you make your husband a priority? Switching out of mommy mode at the end of the day and creating a spicy date night with your husband. I should have looked to see who I was sharing this question with and just deferred the last half to Pam. Um, <clears throat> she'll have something to say about that. Um, I did feel that it was kind of a two-part question, honestly. Um, how do I make my husband a priority? And to be honest with you, it took me a really long time to figure that out because I, I didn't recognize that I was wired to need appreciation. So if I had a hard day with my kids, I wanted my husband to appreciate me for that. If I wanted, if I painted a bedroom, I wanted my husband to notice it and think I was amazing. And um, I didn't really recognize that I, I kind of had that built-in need. And so what that translated into was my husband would come home from work and I had had a hard day and I wanted him to appreciate me and, you know, how many times I'd cleaned up vomit or you know, blow out diaper or, or whatever the the thing was that I wanted appreciation for. And so oh, it was dramatic and, you know, oh, it was so hard. And, you know, and, and I sort of greeted him at the door with this, you know, vomit of words and, and you know, in an effort to get him to appreciate me. And, and he didn't always really respond well, um, oddly, to that. And then I got kind of irritated because I thought, well, I want him to notice this. I shouldn't have to tell him what was going on. So I had this sort of um, weird, subtle communication going on that really wasn't working. And um, and then when he would call during the day, same thing. If it was you know a busy day or a, a frustrating day or whatever, I would answer the phone all weary, you know, thinking he's going to pick up on these verbal cues and you know, oh, what's wrong, honey? Oh, you're amazing. And that wasn't happening. And um, and he finally told me after years, literally, of of this sort of communication, he finally said to me, you know, when I call you during the day, I really like it when you sound excited. Uh, hmm, does that mean I don't sound excited? And I started thinking about it, and, and I kind of went through all the emotions. Well, really? Well, what if you were home with kids who were doing X, Y, and Z, and would you be excited? And no, 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 no. But I realized if on caller ID I saw that it was one of my girlfriends calling, I would manage to sound excited, even in the midst of all of the poo, right? And so, so I... I was convicted about that, and so I determined that I was I was going to change those things. And so, uh, when my husband called, I I put on a happy voice, even if I do not feel happy, and even if I'm not happy with him. When he calls, and for the last couple of years, when he calls and I see his name on caller ID, I say, "Hey, handsome husband," when I answer the phone. And you know what? Even if we're having a fight, that starts a conversation off better. And the other thing that I figured out was when he walks in the door, he's had a long day too, and I want him to share in, in my day. It's our kids. It's not just my kids. I want him to be part of that. But I can wait. I can wait 30 minutes before I unload and dump and share um, all of that stuff with him. Because when he comes in the door, he's just had a long day too. And the truth is, he can tell me about it, but none of it's my responsibility. He does share in the responsibility at home, but I don't share in the responsibility of work. And so I can hold back, which is really hard for me. I can, I can hold all those words back and wait until he's come home. And I make sure every night when he walks in that door, as soon as he sees me, I have a big smile on my face. My eyes are smiling. My face is smiling. For our entire married life, he makes a beeline for me and kisses me when he walks in the door. And that's just a better way to start the evening than him walking in the door, kissing me and me going, oh, the day that I've had. So um, that's kind of making my husband a priority, switching out of mommy mode. And then really quickly, the last half of the question was creating a spicy date night with your husband. We did not have a lot of money for babysitters when our kids were little, so we rarely went out. We did not do the date night once a week, which I love that a lot of y'all do. Um, but, but we made um, sex a priority, and um, there's just a lot of ways that don't cost a lot of money that y'all can do that. Target sells some real cute, sexy panties, and every now and then when I was doing the weekly Target shopping, I'd pick up a pair, and I was sure on that daily phone call when he called me to mention I was wearing them. 
And, you know, when he came in that door, even if he'd had a bad day, there was, you know, there's a little different step to him. And um, there was one time I picked him up from the airport. This is back in the days before 9-11, so you could meet someone at the gate. Um, I was, I was wearing a, a pair of heels, stockings, a garter, and a raincoat, and that was it. And um, that was his preferred way of having me pick him up at the airport from then on out. Um, and there are things you can do that, that really don't cost anything. I've taken a blanket and thrown it on the floor in the bedroom after the kids are in bed and lit candles in the room. And you know what? There's something cool and fun and different about being on the bedroom floor instead of on the bed. Um, there are just lots of things that you can do. But I would say the big thing is thinking about it. When you are um, you know, up to your elbows and in poopy diapers and laundry and cooking and all the things that you're dealing with, um, you kind of forget about that. But if you, if you think about sex with your husband, if you think about making love to your husband, it puts you in a different frame of mind and it does spice things up and you need to let your husband know that you're thinking about him that way. And sometimes all that is is a text that says, hey, thinking about you, dot, dot, dot. And, um, you know, that, that does make for a, a spicier night. <laughs> Question one, and now it's on camera. Last time we did a panel, the whole pastoral staff was up there. And I had a question like this, so <clears throat> now it's on film. So we'll, if we change churches later, you'll know why. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah, I saw this question too as a two-part question. And um, thinking back, because that was a lot of years ago, but again, when you become grandparents and stuff, it gets busy as well. And it did remind me that whenever Robert would come home, no matter what kind of day I had, when I was younger anyway, just flashing your shirt at him is like, what was that? You know? <laughs> Now when you flash them, you're like, what? It's just, it's different. So, um, but it's just, it's a simple things like that. And um, we even have a texting thing, it's called uh, GTP, and it's, you know, guess the panties. So, so he has to just think about it all day, or text me back, the red, the black, da da da. I'm like, no, they're new. And he's like, oh, I don't have a lunch meeting, I'm coming home. So, um, and even with the spicy date night, for me, um, you know, Benadryl works really well, not for you, but for the kids. Um, I don't know how, about, how y'all feel about it. I don't think it's on an endangered list or anything for children, but it helps them sleep. Um, but they'll sleep through it. If they're that age, if they're little bitty, you need to send them to somebody's house kind of thing, too, to get them out of the house. But it is, there's so many things you can do just to be with your husband and truly be with him. Now, I'll be honest, there were many, many nights where he would come home and the three of us were sitting on the floor crying, and I had my purse and my keys, and he knew he had two questions. Have they been fed, and are you coming back? <laughs> One night I mixed up the answers, and he was really panicked, so um, he was glad when I came home that night. Um, but there were times like that that I just had to get out of the house, and then that um, revived me when I came home because everybody was asleep because as soon as I closed the front door, what do you think happened? Every, no, they were all happy. Everybody's laughing, having a good time. Nobody pooped on dad. Nobody threw up, all that stuff. So I came home and they were all asleep. So he was happy. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I just, you know, attacked him. So he, he didn't mind those. But it is, it's a hard time. You, the ladies that have these little ones and stuff, this is hard. So find ways just to make it easy. And, and there are times when we need to have sex too. I mean, seriously, right? So just let them know, and they're like, oh, I'm here for you. Just use me and abuse me, whatever it takes. Yeah, but uh, like I said, the Benadryl works, the texting with um, codes, because you don't want somebody to pick up the phone. You know, he's at a meeting and is sitting there, so we have to text and code back, and, and we figured out our own, you know, coding things, the kids with their LOL and all that. Well, we have our own coding, you know. <laughs> Texting as well, and I've mentioned before with the the glow sticks my table would be disappointed if I didn't mention glow sticks But those are always um, entertaining um, as well that you can again. They're a dollar at Michael's It's like you can buy tons of them and just have them on hand um, But it, it just just find ways and if it's something that makes you laugh He's gonna love it, right? It doesn't take much for them um, even if when they come in the door um, this was shared with me that when her husband comes home, she meets him at the door, and they just kind of make out right there. The kids have learned to run away and scream in another room or cry somewhere else. But it's amazing how much help you have the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. And it's just powerful because they want to help you. 
They really do. They want to help with bath. They want to change the diaper pail thing out. They want to do those things if you just invite them into that. And sometimes inviting them into that is just kissing them, hugging them, groping them. And we're on film. There we go. All right, I just did it. All right, never mind. <laughs> Okay, we are, that's awesome. Okay, so we'll move on to question number two, and this is for Carissa and Jolie. Um, how, we're sticking with the husband theme here. How do you support your husband in a job that he hates? So we go into hot and heavy, too deep. Uh, um, so th that question, you know, obviously is a very deep one, heavy in the sense of, you ask, why would your husband be in a job that he hates? Well, um, for us, my husband was out of work for three and a half years. And so, um, while we lived here in Austin. And so, whenever he got presented this job that he's been at, and we thought it would just be for a short time until the next job came, God had different plans because he is definitely a light in the darkness at where his job is. Um, so, he's been there for two years now. And um, during that time, I've had to learn to... I guess reroute how you know I am as his wife and his helpmate because he was in a job that he loved before. Um, definitely being supportive is a huge thing because he does have dreams and goals of what he would like to be doing. And so during this time that he's at this job, I always remind him, you know, it's just a season. I definitely text him, like they've said, you know, during the day, send pictures of our family, our great weekend that we had to remind him, um, you know, just because that visual for him really helps. Um, to thank him for what he's doing, uh, encouragement, you know, leave little notes in places where maybe in his car or when he opens up his lunch that I made him. And I don't make his lunch all the time, but whenever I do, I'll stick a little note in there. But just those little encouragements. Um, I will plan date nights, um, so that way he has something to look forward to, and we can, you know, plan towards, like, a fun thing for that week. And then one of the things I've shared with some of the ladies in here is that, you know, we women, we have this, we have our girlfriends, but since he does work at a job that, like, so let me just explain what he does. He's an artist, he's a graphic designer, creates, um, and we don't, we don't gamble, but he he does all the designing for all the machines you see in the casinos, um, and we don't gamble. We just think it's so funny. We laugh to God about it all the time. Um, but he is, you know, with gamers at his job. So encouragement is huge for us. And then that, the thing that I started doing was a dialogue night. So since we have each other as girlfriends, and I knew he wasn't, like, connecting with people at his work, um, I made it important that I signed up our daughter at a dance class once a week. And so during that time at the Galleria, he is always there way ahead of time waiting for me. I drop Hannah off, and we go have di dialogue night, which really that is is we go get coffee, and I just let him talk. Like, I just let him talk about his goals, his dreams, you know, and, of course, he'll ask me. But just to remind him, um, you know, that we're moving forward. Um, another thing is I'll let him know what's going on the week ahead so that way he can pick like a couple nights or three nights on his way home from work that he is in the middle of writing a devotion for men. And so he'll pick, a, you know, a couple of those nights to just stop on his way home at a park or a library to, to continue his dreams. It might be to draw. Um, but I'm always encouraging him to move forward. Um, so those are my words. But this is where I'm a little, this, he told me this morning when I told him the question, I had to answer. He said, I wrote, I wrote something for the women to hear because I think it's important for them to hear from me um, what you do for me during this time that I am at a job that I hate. So he said, just promise me you won't read it until you get there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so he put it inside here and I have not read it. So if I can't uh, get through it without, it's just know that we, um, we definitely are a faith family. We do everything in our life where we just are totally trusting God for the next thing. It's, we call it breakthroughs. And so we always think, okay, Lord, when's this next breakthrough coming? So do you mind holding that, this part? Okay. Okay. So this is from my husband, Danny. Okay. When asked to answer the question of my wife supporting me in a job, I really don't care for. Well, that's where we are today. My wife is my partner, and in our par partnership, she purposes to do everything she can to see us walk through the season together. When I use 
the word together. It's the decision to watch and truly listen to where I am, what I need, and help wherever, however she can. Together we will walk knowing that regardless of the situation, we are there for one another, trusting that God is with us, leading us this whole time. Continued communication. Make sure that the lines of communication remain open. This is the primary means to walk together. My wife speaks blessings over me. <laughs> it may seem all it's, it may seem odd at first, but the speaking of spiritual blessing is equipping him with armor and confidence. In conclusion, I would encourage you to take the time to invest into your husband on an occupational level, set as a priority to hear his dreams and goals. This, this now becomes your common dreams and goals. When a man knows his wife is truly on the same team, no opponent will stand in his way. Celebrate the victories, work through the difficulties, and become his biggest cheerleader. Be a wife, helps him reach higher, stretch further, and run longer the race set before him. In this, you will find a deeper love, deeper respect, and a stronger bond. It really comes down to winning together. Pray that God intervenes and leads you and your family through this time. I thank God for a wife who truly gets me, loves me, and supports me to be me. That is, whoop, this is loud, beautiful. And just to the three answers that we've already heard, um, there are so many ways to bless our husbands. Um, my, job, my husband has been in a difficult position for the past four years. Thankfully, that season is now over as God has moved us forward. But um, I agree with everything that Jolie said. Just support your husband's dreams and hear him. Make your home a place that he wants to come home to at the end of the day. And for different men, that means different things. Um, for my husband, he didn't want to be bombarded with my issues with the kids or stuff like that when he came home right away. Um, I needed to welcome him home with open arms, just as these ladies have been saying. I think that's super important. The other thing is that when your husband is wanting to pursue a new career or maybe quit his job and pursue a new path, I think it's important to ask ourselves how we can relieve any financial stress. And that may be taking over uh, paying of the bills. I took that over about three years ago. And that really helped him out a lot. Um, we also downsized. Um, we took financial steps to help him transition to a new job and pursue his dreams. So I think that that was super important and that helped him in just um, being okay with not holding on to something that he wasn't happy with. The other thing, um, as I think about his job transition, really was prayer. Ultimately, the thing that changed my husband's job was that we would pray together over the people who were difficult that he had to work with. We would bless them. Scripture tells us to bless those who insult us and to pray for them. And so we would, by name, go through um, people at his job, and we would pray for their families. We would pray for their salvation. We would lift them up to the Lord. And through that act alone, I could see my husband gaining peace. Um, with his colleagues that were hard. And that was huge. And I can't overemphasize the power of prayer and just walking in the strength of the Holy Spirit when especially you say something to your husband who's had a hard day at work and he's kind of snappy or short and then realizing that, you know what, he's had a really hard day and I need to give a lot of grace. And so instead of returning with a little retort, because I'm really mouthy, um, hugging him and just saying, hey, I know your day's been hard, and I'm here. I'm here for you. And just love, 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 love. And I'm on the other side of that now, that story. And we are stronger for it. Our marriage is stronger. 
he is in um, a good place now. And we are excited about this year. And I'm thankful for the Lord for his faithfulness um, and carrying us through it. That's beautiful. Thank you. This next question is for Stephanie and Janae. What are, what are deliberate things you've done to keep God at the center of your marriage? Um, so just a couple of things. Um, from the time we got married, we made it a priority to go to church together every Sunday. And uh, for some of you, that may seem like, well, duh, right? But um, my parents really uh, modeled that for us in an amazing way. My dad was uh, raised in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, for those of you keeping track at home. And my mom was four square. So in this little town in Nebraska where they grew up, you couldn't have had really more um, different uh, faith backgrounds than they had. And literally everybody said, well, this is never going to work. They're never going to stay married. And when they got married, uh, they agreed that they would always go to church together, and they agreed that they would, um, the church that they chose would not be either one of the churches that they grew up in. And so that was kind of how they kept the peace with that. And, the, and they did that, and they modeled that for me my whole life. So when Alan and I got married, we came from not as wildly different church backgrounds, but different church backgrounds. And we agreed that we would always go to church together. And, and it may end up being one of those denominations that we had grown up in, but it may not be. And the, and the truth is, uh, we call ourselves denominational mutts. We have been um, lots and lots of different denominations, but we've always gone to church together, prayed about where we were going to go to church, and then, um, and then we got involved. And that would be the next thing I would say, is that it's really important that you all um, get involved, give back at the church that you're in. And I would really encourage you to do it as a couple. And I think a lot of times um, women say, oh, I'll volunteer in Sunday school. And the men are like, eh, I'm not going to do that. There's no place for me there. And the truth is, there, there's a great place for men in Sunday school. And it's a way for you guys to connect with your kids and know what they're learning at church. And you all can talk about it as a family later. And it does not mean that your husband's going to have to sit and cut out sheep shapes, you know, for the craft <laughs> later. Um, there, are, there are lots of great ways for men to volunteer in Sunday school that don't involve little arts and crafts, and, and it's awesome for the kids to see men of God in the Sunday school. But, you know, if that's not what y'all want to do, do something else. There are tons and tons of ways to volunteer, but I'd encourage you um, to do some volunteering together at your church. It's a great way to keep God the center of what you're doing, and then you're both on the same page, and you can talk about it. Um, I would encourage you to pray together. Alan and I have never been great about praying together on a daily basis. Um, I know a lot of couples who do, and I think it's super cool. And for whatever reason, we don't. We do pray together pretty frequently, but not daily. But we both pray, and we spend a lot of time talking about um, things of God, what we're reading in the Bible, uh, what the sermon was at church. Um, there was a Facebook post I read yesterday morning before I got up for church that brought up some theological issues. So when my poor husband woke up, I was ready. I was like, okay, I want to talk to you about this. He's you know, still wiping the sleepy out of his eyes. Um, and, and, and I had a lot of words. But, um, but I would encourage you to do that. Talk about about things of God with your husband. Talk about things of God with your husband in front of your children. Um, it is important that that we discuss those things um, around our kids. I'd talk about the sermon on the way home from church um, with your husband, with your kids. Um, go over it, discuss it, keep it at the center of things. And then I would encourage you both to read God's Word. Um, you or your husband may not be used to reading the Bible. And um, every other year, Alan and I read through the Bible in a year. And there are a good Million different um, programs you can follow. You can go straight through. You can do a chronological. You can do a chronological with a psalm a day. I mean, literally, there are a ton of them. You can do them on your Bible app now. Um, so some years, Ellen and I do the do the same um, schedule, and so we're we're literally reading the same stuff at the same time. And a lot of other years we don't. Um, but it brings stuff up. We we end up discussing what we're reading in God's Word. And then on those off years, it's not like you know the the Bible sits and collects dust for a year. Um, we just don't aren't purposeful about going through the whole Bible in a year, but um, but we're both reading God's Word, and um, and it may seem awkward if you've if you've never talked about the Bible with your husband, or if you've never talked about the sermon with your husband. But the truth is, um, your man's 
got a, got a mind, he's got a brain, he's thinking about these things, and he may want to talk to somebody about them. So I would just encourage you to, hey, what'd you think about that? Or, do you know what I read in the Bible the other day? This has just been rolling around in my head, and, and you know, I'd like to get your opinion on that. And I'd really encourage you guys um, to do that. And then the last thing I would say is um, pray for each other. Pray for your husband. Um, ask him to pray for you. I'm uh, always surprised at their reaction when a wife asks her husband to, to pray for her, um, they'll do it. They will pray for you. And if you have something specific you want him to pray about, ask him to pray about that. You are enabling him to be a spiritual leader in your household when you do that. And don't forget to pray for him too. Yeah, so I agree with all of that you've said. And it's, um, and I, I'm answering this question a little bit differently. Um, because I, at first, when I was early on in marriage, uh, I remember I had the hopes and the expectations that my husband would be the spiritual leader and that we would be praying together and be going to church together and all of that. And he was a believer. However, we just walked differently in, in, our, in our faith. And I've come to understand and accept his faith walk. And so, um, in, in answer to this question, deliberately what I've done to keep, it, to keep God the center of the marriage is really first is for me to, to have God be the center of my marriage and be center in my life. And so that is really huge for me um, because really I came to realize that I, when I start to expect my husband to expect him to pray or expect him to lead um, or expect him to be that, um, to invite me into prayer or to have those quiet times or devotionals that I was hoping for, and we'd have them occasionally, but it wasn't consistent. Um, when I realized that God is my royal husband, like in Psalm, I think, 43, I think it says, um, I really started to believe, re realize that God's my royal husband, and so bringing God into my marriage through me, and then I started to have the mindset of, if God is in the center of my for God to be the center of the mar my, our marriage, then I need to have God the center of my marriage. God is in me, and God is in my husband. And if God is in me, and God is in my husband, then I can acknowledge the God in my husband. So affirming my husband for who he is, and what he, and looking for the good in him, and accepting who he is. Um, I really started to look at it instead of what he's not. Um, I started to look at for who he is, and call that out. And that is bringing God in the marriage. And that is bringing God in the center and bringing in the strengths of who we are and I kind of think of it as that three-legged stool that you know it's my relationship and I don't have control over my husband's relationship with God I know he's a believer his faith is so different it's quiet it's he and himself and God and um, and I had to put aside what other people thought because I know in the church it's very um, it can be very judgmental. Are y'all doing this? Are you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? And I had to let that go and trust and believe and, and start to see who God created my husband to be and call that out and recognize that um, in, in him. So, um, so my focus becomes more on God and me bringing God into, into our marriage that way. Um, so who I am, yeah. All righty, thank you. Okay, for our next question, it is for Ms. Chrissy and Pam. What are some tips and advice to give a marriage and family struggling with an affair? How would you specifically pray? Um, well, first of all, I think um, I'm gonna answer the end of the question first, uh, and that is to pray. And to pray specifically, um, that your heart would be kept soft. Because when your heart gets hard, um, Satan has a foothold and that's, it's downhill from there. So um, the next thing I would say is, you know, to go to your church, get support, um, counseling, and um, figure out you, you both need it because if there's an affair, there's um, something is lacking on both sides. Mm -hmm. So, and not that I'm condoning it, it's wrong. We take a vow before God, and um, but we're human sometimes, and yeah, so prayer and support 
and counseling speci specifically for um, this type of situation. And there's a lot of resources out there um, for in the church within the church communities for families that are going through um, affairs and how to restore and rebuild. Yeah, this is this is. I think one of the saddest things that is um, growing in the church right now um, is the, the fact of affairs, um, divorce, just separation in general. And the root of it is because trust has been broken. And if that's ever happened to you even before, you still have those feelings when trust is broken. Rebuilding trust is your choice. And it's a choice that both you and your husband make um, in this situation. I agree with Chrissy that there's a lot of help out there, and it is, um, it's a hard thing to say, but please hear what we're saying, that there is um, cause for both sides to seek help, okay? Um, I believe that the, the conversation is the relationship, so if your marriage is not to that point of DEF CON where it's actually an affair, there's things that happen all along the line before that. Where was the conversation? Where was the honesty? Um, when you were dating and you're all excited and you're engaged, you told him everything, right? Same thing with him. He told you everything. Where did that go? Where did that conversation go? When did it stop? When did you start harboring? You're late every night. Every night you come home, I fix dinner, you're not here. When your wording can change, I really love it when you come home at six o'clock. I wait for you, I anticipate your arrival. Those kind of words can build or destroy relationships. When that part starts happening, other things can come in as well. Um, and even in that, as you're in the recovery stage, because the, the question was kind of like the recovering part, um, I have two questions for you is, what's the most important thing to you right now? Is it to, to go back and bring all of that stuff up? Is it to stand strong where you are now and look for how can I get help that's going to keep moving me forward um, in this relationship of rebuilding and rebuilding trust? Um, and then the next one is what usually stops you? What keeps you from going to that counselor or asking someone else about a different program or what else can we do? Where can he go? Um, and ladies, there's a lot of things in this question. It's a pretty loaded question because if there's things that have happened to you in your past that you have not dealt with, that had to do with a broken trust, relationship, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, all of those things, even for him as well. If there's things that have not been dealt with, they're gonna show up somehow. When they show up, are you gonna fight or flight? What are you gonna do? Um, seeing the, um, um, I can't think of the word, but the bad side of divorce, watching children, uh, my own grandson is part of this right now that I never anticipated, ever, right? You live your life with a marriage and you fight for your marriage and so your kids are gonna do the same thing, right? And didn't happen. And watching this little boy have to leave his daddy every other weekend and stuff, it breaks my heart. So if there's any way that you guys can hear today, fight for your children. You're not fighting for what's right and wrong and what happened here, because there's so much there. And that's where the counseling and the different programs, affair recoveries, all kinds of things out there to help you. But look in those babies' eyes, because they need to see that daddy every day. And they need to see their mommy every day. And if it's something that you struggle with, um, physically, emotionally, mentally, if there's medications you need, get on them. Okay? If there's new friends you need, get rid of the old friends. Whatever it takes, because look in those babies' eyes, they need two parents that are in love with each other that they can look at and say, you're fighting for me every day. Because the world is not out there fighting for them. I'd li I like to piggyback again. I'd like to say one more thing, and I can't stress that enough, and I'm so glad that you brought that point up, is children. Um, you loved your husband enough to marry him and have babies with him. And your kids, that's security for your babies. Um, 
I divorced my first husband when my children were um, adults. And to this day, my children are now in their 30s. To this day, my kids long for our family. Even though it was right and it needed to happen, mm -hmm. kids suffer. So whatever you can do to um, work on you, you can't fix your husbands, you can only work on you. Do it. For the sake, if for any other reason, for the sake of your kids, but geez, you know God hates divorce, and there's a reason for it. The ramifications are endless. Thank you, guys. Let's move to the Santa Claus question. Mm -hmm. uh, Janae kind of touched on this, which is awesome, and we're going to hear from Penny on this one. Penny. How do you navigate your marriage when your husband is a believer but not strong in his faith nor a spiritual leader? Um, I love this one. I really do. Um, I'm going to be talking to y'all in February about, I have a whole presentation on the role of the wife. And so we're going to get into this in great detail. But today, let me just tell you, first of all, you have great power, ladies, because you are a huge influencer on your man. And let me just tell you that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And no matter what kind of... Uh, spiritual warfare is coming against your family, you plus your prayers are a majority. You can pray your man into all. I've prayed Jerry into so many things. And here's the cool part. He's back there. Um, the cool part is that you can pray boldly on this because it is God's will for the man to be the head of the home. God only calls us as women to be the helpers. So if your man is not a good leader, what are you doing? Are you on your knees talking to the Lord about it? Because I promise you, I've had ladies say to me, my man's not a leader type. If he's a man and he's your husband, God intends him to be a leader. And he intends you to help him. That means you don't nag and nip at everything he does. And when he makes a decision, you don't second guess it. Or if it doesn't turn out right, you don't say, I told you so. Because would you really want him doing that if you had to make the last decision? Ladies, let me ask you something. If I told you that I have the secret for how to keep your man on his knees before the Lord every single day, would you like to hear the answer? Okay, here it is. I said to Jerry... Anytime we have a tie vote, I am going to afford you the swing vote. And the kids and I are going to do what you decide. And you answer to God for how it turns out. <laughs> if he is a good man, if he is a man who's walking with the Lord, that's going to put a good bit of fear and trembling into him. And he may test you on it a couple of times just to see if you really mean it. And any of you who know me know I'm no doormat, and I'm certainly not opinionless. And if he's smart, he'll check with you. But you know what? There's something very empowering about telling your man, you are it. You are the deciding gating factor in this home. It makes them feel valuable and important. Do you know how many men today walk away because they don't feel like they, they're just sperm donors after that? Who really needs them? You don't want your man to feel that way. Because, ladies, there's plenty of women out there, when they see a ring on your man's finger, you know what they say? They don't say he's taken. They say he's willing to commit. Ladies, if you wanted him, somebody else does too. So do everything you can to keep him. And one of the best ways is to let your man lead and enable him, equip him. Every time he does make a decision, back him up. Believe in him. You can be his biggest cheerleader. If you wanted your kids to grow up to be something, would you sit around judging them every time they made a mistake? No. You'd be their biggest cheerleader. You can do this. I believe in you. Don't worry about it. Because here's the thing. If your husband comes home and says, God's told me we need to buy two motorcycles, and you're going, uh, I don't think we're talking to the same God. <laughs> you know what you do? You say, okay. And then here's what you do. Every time you feel afraid about it, you tell the Lord. Lord, I'm scared about this. And if he wrecks one, oh well. I didn't have to do anything about it. 
if he survives, then God wanted him to stay with us. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And this works for changing your husband too. If there's something I want Jerry to change, I tell him once. After that, I tell God every single time it bugs me. And over time, what happens is either Jerry changes or I get over it. But here's the deal. When Jerry does change, God gets the glory and my faith in my prayers goes through the roof because I realize I've prayed Jerry into something or out of something, and we have. I'm sure he's prayed me into things too because now he knows that this is one of the things I teach. <laughs> you can use it on your kids too. But just give him practice. Don't fear God is ultimately in charge of the success of your family, not your husband. God will guard your finances, your heart, and your children's future if you will put things in their proper order and let your man be the head of the home. Thanks, Penny. Alrighty, the next question is for uh, Janae, and it is, how do you empower a cautious child? So this was a hard question because I wasn't quite sure what cautious meant. So that's what I get do is I get curious about why a child's cautious. So um, <clears throat> I'm a mom and I'm also, um, but I've also been a school counselor for about 20 years. And so I'm kind of speaking it through that piece. My daughter's not so, not necessarily the cautious one, um, but there were times that she was in the sense of just developmentally. So you got to figure out developmentally, is this where a child is? is are they about that eight, nine months separation anxiety? in that two, three, four age that they might be cautious just because they're, they're exploring and they're curious. And so we get down on our knees and we just explore with them. So um, just exploring um, and seeing and discovering their new world with them. So one thing with um, children that are just questioning and, cur and just unsure about things is just um, speaking verbally what you see and the safety that, and so you're creating a safe environment for them. So you're just speaking out what you are seeing out, the, out that's happening. Um, it's gonna be very natural, of course, for them to be um, sensitive to loud sounds and clown faces and things like that. So that would be for the early age developmental uh, times that, you're, that, you, that children are gonna be naturally cautious. As children get older um, and they're cautious, then my, I'm curious about, um, and for myself, if my child is scared of something, what am I feeling at the time? It's so checking my internal uh, system and seeing if, if I'm fearful because our children and people around us can pick up um, what we're feeling and, and, um, and we'll, we'll start to pick that up from them. So um, develop, developing a real safe safe system, a safe, I'm sorry, safe environment where they feel safe and secure is, is critical. So if you're not feeling that, for you to be talking to God and going up and bringing in, because he didn't give us a spirit of fear, he gave us a spirit of love and a sound mind. And so really calling on that spirit of love and trusting in him and then trusting in, um, for your child and, and empowering your child to make decisions. I'll speak about this later too. And that speaking out two good decisions that could, ha could be happening if they're trying to take, you know, take a step in trying something new or they're seeing some friends out there playing, ask them what they see, um, really get them familiar with the environment because we're taking it in 240 times a second, whether or not we are safe. And so our bodies are taking in from our five senses what's happening, and so, and so are our little ones. And that can be very overwhelming for them, if you can imagine. And so really it's providing that safety for them to feel like they can walk safely in their environment. So That was awesome, thank you. This next question is for Chrissy and Penny. How do you set healthy boundaries with your parents and in-laws? Okay. Uh, I think there's two verses that come into play here. Honor your father and mother, and a man shall leave his husband and wife and cleave to his wife. Leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. So you have honor and leave and cleave. And the trick is that if, if you want to cleave, sometimes you have to politely honor, but draw boundaries. 
The hard part in all this is that there's usually one in the couple who's already left and they're okay. But sometimes there's one in the couple, that would have been me, that had not left. My mother was my BFF, and I talked to her constantly every day, and I let her make decisions for me. I asked her to make decisions for me. Now, granted, when we married, I was 21. Give me a break, okay? But I, I allowed my mother especially to have way too much power in our marriage in the early years. And Jerry was frustrated and hurt by it. Um, and I didn't understand why, because they're my family. Of course I love them, you know. Uh, and it was very difficult for me. Uh, and Jerry, I think, would have loved to have gone in and told him to back off. But you see, that wouldn't have helped me grow. Um, if you've got a spouse who's ready to go to battle with your family, don't let them. Because honestly, the parent now that we're in-law parents, I can tell you that m my daughter Leah could say things to me that it may sound firm or unkind, and I'm going to forgive her because she's my baby girl. But if my super son-in-law Mark, who I adore, but if he said those same things to me, it'd be much harder for me to forgive him. I'd be like, who is this boy? you know, trying to talk to us like this. So I understand it now from a parent point of view as well. And let me tell you that your parents are not going to help you draw these boundaries. <laughs> they're just not. If they're all in, if they're a big Southern family that's all up in everybody's business like mine, they are not going to help you draw boundaries. You must do it. But you got to remember that this union, this marriage, is the primary union that you need to draw a circle around and protect and so that means you check with your spouse before you make plans with in-laws. That means that you, uh, you don't ever throw your spouse under the bus to your in-laws. You know, well, we would, I'd come, but, you know, Jerry can't get off work. Oh, dear. No, don't do that. You know, we can't come. We've got plans. And so it takes courage. And if you've got a very in interfering, bossy, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking this question from the standpoint of time. Uh, deal with your parents if they're requesting more of your time than you're ready to give. Um, if they're popping in to your home without calling first, you can say, I'd prefer you call first to make sure we're available. There needs to be some healthy boundaries of separation after you marry, and that marriage needs to be protected at all costs. Um, see me later. There's some other uh, techniques I can give you. <laughs> And for the, for the spouse who's not as connected and doesn't understand, be patient. Just pray for that spouse and be patient that they'll finally grow up and get the courage to separate from whatever holds them to mom and daddy. For me, it was that I was used to being the, the family pleaser. I was the good kid. And I, I felt like I owed it to them to always do what they wanted me to do. And so I had to reframe who I was. Now I'm a good wife. I'm not the good daughter. I can be a nice daughter, but that's not my primary role. I agree with everything Penny said, um, but I'd like to take things from a little bit different perspective. So I remember when I was first married, I was a, a young bride, and um, I had a problem, and I was very close with my dad. Daddy? blah, 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 blah. Hmm. And he said, Chrissy, you're married now. You take this to your husband. Mm -hmm. I was devastated, but he was right. And then um, my children are adults. I have a 32-year-old and a 34-year-old. And so that means I'm probably old enough to be many of your moms. <laughs> we won't talk about that too much. Um, my children have taught me to set boundaries, very healthy boundaries. No, can't do that. We have something else planned, or that doesn't work, or thank you for that. They've taught me to ask before offering advice. It's hard as a mom to stop. Because mm -hmm. you love your kids, you're, you're still mom. That doesn't change. But our roles change. And we go from being a caretaker to a friend. And 
the transition is not easy, trust me. And when they are sick, especially girls, they want their moms. And it's wonderful when they want us because that all that nurturing that, that is in, still inside of us and never goes away, um, we get to use that and it's great. But we have to be careful that we don't step on our son-in-law's or our daughter-in-law's toes. So just, it's okay. Just, yes, that's great, but no thank you. That's it, that's it, it's easy. I mean, it doesn't, it's not easy, but it works. And you know what? I've, there's never been one time where I have been offended. Quite the contrary, it, would, it taught me that I was overstepping bounds. And I was great, I'm like, I'm sorry, you're right. Mm -hmm. So, it's okay. You're a family, you're the most, you and your husband and children are the most important family. I'll jump in one last thing. My, my daughters are 30 and 34, and they will say, I know you loved being a mom, but now your role is done. And I'm like, you're right, you're right. You know, you don't, my advice is worth every bit of what you pay for it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, next question is going to be for Stephanie. How do you feel about missing church on Sunday for sports? Penny just said, I'm interested in hearing the answer to this one. Um, so I feel like I should put on my asbestos suit in case y'all are going to fire anything at me before I say this. I can only tell you what we did in our family. And um, that was, was we did not miss church for sports. And that was really hard. Um, but we were purposeful about it, and we had already established with our kids when they were little that church was a priority. Um, we didn't skip church because we were tired or because Alan and I had had a late event the night before. Um, uh, you know, so our kids had already seen that, that church was important, and, um, and we were making it a priority. And then as they were getting older and they were getting to become better athletes, we were really purposeful about looking at teams, especially teams that um, were club teams that would require travel and that sort of thing. We would look at their schedules uh, for the game schedules. And there were a lot of teams that we chose not to be part of because they had Sunday morning games. And then especially for our son Isaiah, as he got older and older and um, was playing baseball in the summer, most summer teams would have uh, Sunday games. And without us prompting him, he went to his coach and he said, Coach, if it's a Sunday morning game, I'll be late. I'll go to church first. And, and we were giddy. I mean, it, it wasn't a fight. It wasn't, we didn't have to have the conversation ourselves. Coach is always going to appreciate it coming from a kid rather than from the parent. They always are a little nervous when they see you coming at them. And, um, and so that's the way it was. And, you know, there were times, honestly, especially for Isaiah, that he had to sit out a game uh, because he was late, got there late, and the coach was irritated with him, and he sat there. And you have to understand, we are, um, we're a family that really talks a lot about supporting your team and being part of the team and not letting your team down. And so, so this, was a, this was a sticky spot, you know? How, is, how are we supporting the team and being part of the team if he's not there for a Sunday morning game? Um, but we decided that honoring God was our priority and that uh, by honoring God, we were going to put it in God's hands. And there were times that it felt uncomfortable. There were certainly times when my son did not get to play, even though he was maybe the better player, but because he was late. But, um, but I really believe that, that God will honor those decisions. And, you know, we may or may not get to connect those dots here on earth, but when we get to heaven, I think we're going to get to see all those times when God said, 
You know, when you were obedient here, this is what happened. And when you were obedient there, this is what happened. And so that's how our family dealt with it. I have, um, because I ran children's programs for so long, uh, in Colorado, ice time for hockey teams was Sunday mornings. And so um, every time hockey season started, I'd, I'd lose half the kids in my program, all the little hockey players. And I had all these conversations with parents. I, I can give you the argument. I can give you the reasoning. I can, I can make my eyes look the way their eyes look uh, when they're talking to me about all the good reasons why their kid is missing it because they're going to go on scholarship to college for this sport and they're going to, you know, X, Y, and Z with this sport. And, and I'll just say, take it to God. Um, you know, if your child is really that uh, 0.25 of 1% athlete that's actually going to play beyond high school, um, God will still take care of him or her. God's, God's got this in his hands. Um, if you're counting on that athletic scholarship for college, um, God will still provide a way for pay for college. Um, I think that sometimes we, we take these decisions away from him because we, we reason them. Our society tells us we're idiots. You know, if we're not, I actually had a, a girl um, in Colorado in one of my programs quit her soccer team, and the coach called her mother and told her mother he was going to report her to social services because her daughter was such a good soccer player that it was literally criminal for her to be out of soccer so that she could go to church. Um, you know, so I think our society has gotten things maybe a little out of balance on the whole sports things. And I think as followers of Christ, we have to be careful um, and make sure that we make what's really important, important. So that's how we did it at our house. Yeah, good job, thanks. <laughs> I love it whenever you answer those tough questions. <laughs> it's in there, it's funny. Okay, the next question is for Jolie and Chrissy. It's kind of a long question, so I can repeat the second part if you need me to. Do you feel it is okay to have one-on-one -on -one time with your children? to not include one child and go on a date with the other? And how do you explain to the child not participating? And how do you handle the guilt? Um, I, for us and our family, um, to kind of set the grounds of where our kids are now, our oldest will be 25 in December, and our middle child is almost 21, and our caboose is almost nine, and our daughter is the one who's almost nine. And then we have a grandbaby that's over two, and another grandbaby due in January. So I'm speaking from starting way back when, and I feel like you're the temperature gauge of your home. So by starting when they're young, they don't know any different because you've set that as part of a tradition in your home. So when they were, my boys were younger, they were four and a half years apart. And so I didn't grow up with dates with my mom or dad, but I did, you know, know people that did that with their kids. And I thought, I will always do that with my children because I just thought that was the coolest thing to have one-on-one -on -one time with your mom or dad. I just thought that was so cool. Um, so with our boys, when Colton, um, was younger and then our we started when he was about four and a half and I would stay with Colton and say maybe my husband would take like Levi uh, to go camping overnight or just to go have guy time and go for a bike ride or whatever it is and um, they still love that like my son who's almost 25 asked me the day when are we going to go on our date to go on a bike ride um, I have a son who said, before we go out of town this weekend, can we have a date this week? And he wanted to treat me to Cheesecake Factory. So it all comes full circle. Um, just because that one-on-one -on -one time uh, is so crucial because you've got eye contact, you're laughing. Um, I really, honestly, the thing I've done with it is as they've gotten older, I take the seriousness out of it. Like, I try to make it to be fun. I mean, as they got older, you know, they would have girlfriends or um, 
you know, there would be a little bit more complex things going on, but I always chose to make sure that when we have a date, we would have fun and we would laugh and we wouldn't talk about things that were serious because guess what? They won't have a date with you if it's always going to be serious. Um, so with that being said, I, I don't have to ask my older kids for dates anymore. They come to my husband and say, can we go camping? Just you and I, um, we become their friends in their lives and obviously mentors too. Um, but we've done our part. We've launched them. And now I have daughter-in-law who wants to like spend one-on-one -on -one time with me. And then a son who has a girlfriend of three years that now works with me. So you'll have your chances in life to have those one-on-ones where you get to do the serious. But the thing I would reiterate is just don't make anything serious when you're doing dates. This morning was a prime example that my husband um, asked our daughter, would you like to go on a date with daddy? Um, and she just looked at him with her big brown eyes and she goes, yes. And, and he said, well, would you like to go on a date with daddy tonight? And she got all giddy and happy and excited. And she's like, well, can we go to Chick-fil-A or can we go to? And so she's like, do you like my outfit, daddy? This is what I'll be wearing. And so know that you're setting up for even your daughters of who their expectations are of who they date because they're, they're dating their daddy. And so my husband, when he takes her out on a date tonight, will probably put some little fun questions together, trivia, um, and he'll pull the chair out and open the door and treat her as he does myself when we go on dates. And I still see our oldest do that with our daughter-in-law and make sure she's, when they come over, he pulls out the chair for her. So the guilt part of it, I would say that is just, there's no guilt in that because you're setting up something that's beyond measurable of what you could dare think or imagine of what you, in receiving, on the receiving end. Like I said, we have a daughter we're raising now, so I'm ecstatic that her expectations of what she sees in her daddy when they go on dates is what she's gonna be looking for. Um, and so, the other thing is you don't have to spend a lot of money. I had a picnic with my daughter the other day and we laid on the blanket and we just put our food out and we looked up at the clouds and we had one-on-one -on -one time for about an hour then. You can go putt-putt. Uh, my favorite thing is to do Groupon and do pat get discounts with paddle boarding or kayaking or there's you know ways to you know cut corners and, and do those dates. And then the main thing too is to put it on your calendar because um, that's a question that will be answered later that I'll do. But if you don't put it on the calendar, it won't happen. And so even though my husband asked our daughter to go on a date, I told him probably four days ago, um, I've scheduled you to have a date with our daughter. And he's like, oh, cool. You know, because he's so busy that I need to be kind of the gauge to help that happen or it wouldn't happen. And that's okay. I don't expect him to be like, oh, I need to go on a date. But when it all comes together, um, you were the source to get it going. And then full circle, you've got your older kids coming back and saying, hey, when are you available to go on a date with me? So um, that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there isn't a lot for me to add um, other than to ask, I want to ask a question. How many of you need one-on-one -on -one time with your best friend or your spouse? Mm -hmm. You can raise your hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, me too. So do your kids. Mm -hmm. They're no different. And that's an opportunity for them to get to know you a little differently and you to get to know them um, at a deeper level as an individual because we're all fearfully and wonderfully and uniquely made. So, yeah, and no guilt. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll anticipate it. Your time is coming next, mm -hmm. you know? This is when we're, like, putting it on the calendar, like Jolie said, um, and pointing to that this is when we get to do this. So it's so much fun. You will learn to look forward to the time. It's just precious, and it will continue. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, next question is for Penny and Pam. How do you know when you're done having babies? <laughs> Go ahead, Amy. Okay. Well, th this is a loaded question, too, because, I mean, it, as your body gets older, it gets older and it does things. And it's like, I don't know if I want to add being pregnant to that with everything else. Everything would just be touching. It's like, 
That would give me claustrophobia. Um, there's things, you know, in your past. My mom enrolled me in Baylor, and then the next day enrolled my youngest brother in preschool. It's like, seriously, mom? So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I don't want that. Um, and then, you know, there's the numbers. If you find that you've left one at the gas station more than once, maybe you're through with having children. Um, you know, Julie has eight, and she's happy. If I had eight, I'd be like, I... I didn't even know I could count that far, you know? <laughs> Put them all in the same clothes or something, let them just blend together as one. Um, for Robert and I, we, Jason and Allie were very close together. Um, you can get pregnant while you're nursing. Um, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. So yes, um, <laughs> there we were with two, 15 months apart. Um, and then we lost two after that, um, and my eyesight had changed, and I got a cavity each time I got pregnant or lost a baby. So I told Robert, I'm like, you know, at this point I'm going to be blind or toothless if we <laughs> keep trying. So um, we, we, just, we decided to go to a marriage workshop to make sure the marriage was strong with two children that were close in age. And, and we did kind of the voting thing with them, too, but we told them they, all, they get one vote, one vote. Dad gets 15, and Mom gets as many as she needs. So um, they knew they would never win. But anyway, so we decided we need to go to a marriage conference and get all this stuff worked out. And they gave us a lot of homework, like write out all of your feelings and write out this and write, 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 write. And I'm like, Robert, and I'll make a deal with you. If I can just copy your answers, you know. And that's where we had Justin. Um, and we call him just in time um, because we just in time. <laughs> we uh, we had talked about it a lot. We you know again it's I think it's a it's a decision that you make together. Obviously, don't surprise your husband. Oh hey, guess what? When he had already thought we were just going to have two or eight or whatever, and thought you were done, and all of a sudden, um, so definitely don't do anything like that. I believe this is something too that again your past. Um, if you've grown up in a huge family and he's an only child, it's a whole conversation mm -hmm. to figure out the numbers. Um, financially, if you're having a hard time getting by and then you want to just keep on and keep on, just know that's going to be a major struggle in your life um, as well and not let that become a resentment. But again, I think talking to them as much as possible. Um, I will tell you this, since we've, I'm already on camera anyway. Um, after we had Justin, we both decided to take care of it, you know, um, just to make sure that nothing happened again. And um, it's been awesome ever since then. It's like, <laughs> this is the best ever. So, um, and we love all three of them. And now we've got um, five grandchildren under the age of three. And I think if we had had a lot more kids, Oh, that's just a lot of grandchildren. So <laughs> I'm glad we stopped at three. Yeah, um, I would say that in, in our case, um, after we had our second child, uh, there was a time when I really, really, really wanted us to have a third child. And Jerry really, really, really did not. And the reason being that... Um, I had Meredith when I was 25, Leah at 29. So long about 31, I'm thinking, yeah, let's do this again. We, we do well at this thing. But my husband is six years older than I am. So he was 37 and he was at IBM and he was traveling a lot. I mean, he was Advantage Platinum. And I said, well, don't you want to try for that boy? And he said, actually, if we have a boy now, I don't think I'm going to be around enough to really be a good dad to this boy. And so, um, and we were one of those marriages that twice in our marriage, we didn't use birth control and we named them Meredith and Leah. So like we didn't even wash our underwear together. And so I was talking to my mother and I said, you know, I could slip one in on him real easy. And my mother goes, Penny, listen, you need, to, you need to not even joke about this. You need to make this a matter of prayer. If somebody says no between the two of you, that's God's sign to wait. And if you start praying about it earnestly, and if the Lord changes his heart, then you go full force and you know it's the right thing to do. But if the Lord does not change his mind, then you need to wait on this thing. Because if you go around Jerry behind his back and do this, if he ever found out, it would break the trust worse than if you cheated on him. Because what if he blames the child? What if he holds it against the child? I mean, is this really, do you want to gamble with the life of a baby? Yeah. 
And so, you know, we didn't. We didn't have that third child. And it was hard for me for a long time. Um, I still think we, we, this is one of the things we do well together. But you know what? I deferred to the Lord and my husband. And so it worked out just fine. But I will say on the other side of that coin, we all know in this room it takes more than joining a sperm and an egg to make a baby. It takes the divine touch of the hand of God. And if there is a divine touch when you weren't planning it, that doesn't mean it was a surprise to God. It means he overrode all your efforts to send you this baby. And he has a big plan. So every child is a gift from God. Don't ever view it as anything other than that. But if you come to an impasse, my advice, which like I said, take it for what it costs, is wait until you both are agreed one way or the other. Thank you. The next question is for Carissa and Janae. And it is, how do you get on the same page as far as child rearing with your husband? <laughs> Go for it, girl. Okay. Um, that's a very hard question. Uh, it's a very hard question because we are just, we come from different backgrounds. And so, first of all, we are on different pages a lot of the time. And so, of course, the power of prayer um, uh, and coming together, lots of conversations uh, about what you think is important. Um, but I would say, first is uh, well, one of the things that has helped us a lot is just t is is taking parenting classes to give us the language to have conversations. So those have been really helpful um, to just have that that language and that conversation, and to go through a study of some sort to actually so that we can have that language to talk through what's important. And then the times that we do do things differently, because we are going, we just do them differently. We were raised differently. Um, there are things that are important, to, more important to me than they are to my husband, and there are times that I'll need to back off um, and as well as he will and so just listening for that those times um, the so sometimes when I, we have to look at what's um, what's important what's the value I'm wanting to that we're wanting to instill so if we're in disagreement we may have to put a pause on the the discipline or whatever it is that's happening at the time and actually uh, us have a conversation and what's the value we're wanting to instill um, um, in our child um, and there was one more oh is that um, the, is to also look for the the similarities um, that you do that you do parent together because again if we're looking for our differences we're going to find differences so really looking for those similarities and um, and the fact is is that our children need those differences they need the father to to be pulling out identity and protection and security and they need the nurturing heart of a mother and so there are going to be those differences and to celebrate those differences um, and to back off um, at times when our husband is 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 providing what he does bring to um, to the to the um, child rearing so and I the only thing I would add to that is that we need to make sure that the page we want to be on is God's page mm -hmm. and not our own agenda and so I can say for years I would just really struggle with this because we did come from different backgrounds very different backgrounds and it became a point of contention in our marriage. And so at the end of the day, your children are gonna grow up and they're gonna go live their life and you're still going to have your husband. And so when you think about your parenting, is it more important to glorify God and honor your husband in your marriage? Or, or, or is it more important for you to be right in how you think your kids need to be parented? And I can say from experience that it's more important that in the moment I honor my husband and I ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want me to handle this situation? And I think that when we choose to honor God and we seek to really lift our husbands up instead of tear them down, for what they should be doing, God really shows up. Mm -hmm. And he begins to work um, in ways that we can't even see. Um, Colossians 3, 
I'm going to read a couple things because um, as I was thinking about this question, God's word gives us the answers, ladies, to everything. Um, and Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on things above and not on the things that are on earth. So when you're sitting there and you're like, oh my goodness, we are doing this wrong. I can't believe he just did that. Didn't he notice that kid was disrespectful? Um, all this stuff. We can go on these little rabbit trails in our brains of anxiety and fear that we're not parenting right or whatever. Set your mind on things above. God's grace and mercy is more than sufficient to turn our imperfections and mistakes into things that are good, and he can instill good things in our kids even when we're messy and imperfect. So keep your mind set on Jesus and not about your performance and your husband's performance. And then it goes on and it says that, so those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Forgiveness, ladies. Forgive yourself when you mess up with your parenting. Forgive your husband and ask God to redeem those situations. I can remember being so mad at my kids for some things and yelling at them, and then my husband would get really mad at me because I was yelling, and then years down the line, I mentioned one of those things to one of my kids, and I said, do you remember that? They had no clue what I was talking about. And so sometimes I think we're so in our head over stuff, and we so overanalyze, and we um, kind of overemphasize the impact our mistakes will make when in reality, um, if our hearts are towards the Lord, he really does cover so much with his grace. Um, the next verse says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Love. And then it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. And then he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. God has appointed you and your husband to be the parents of your kids, and he is faithful and will equip you to do what you need to do. And that is just an act of grace and mercy. And so, verse 18 tells us, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And what Penny just told us about being submissive to our husbands, when we have a disagreement on how to parent our kids, but your husband has a strong opinion maybe, let him, let him go with it. And your, relation, your responsibility is to the Lord to pray and to work on your own um, parenting and celebrate, like she said, the strengths um, of one another and inform the weaknesses. And I say the word inform because when we take classes, we seek counseling, we read books, we're informing our weaknesses and we are turning those weaknesses into strengths. We're becoming equipped. Um, and I think that's super important. But I love that um, at the end of the day, you're probably not going to be on the same page on so many things, but that's okay. Um, don't ever let your differences in parenting place a root of bitterness against your husband in there that would start to grow and start to overtake really your marriage. It's, it's not worth it. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is going to be for Janae. How do you practice gratitude in a Christ-like manner with your children? Discipline in a Christ-like manner. Do you have Christian-based parenting book recommendations? Okay. Um, gratitude, I just do it all the time. And so the mo you do, is that's just us do me doing it throughout the day. I'm so thankful for, I'm grateful for. We do it at, our, at the table. We do it throughout the day. We do it through the difficult times when things are happening, when there's mean, you know, things that are happening that they're, the kids are treating each other uh, mean and just and being grateful. So that really is uh, um, being demonstrated through just you as a mom and as you walk through life. And if I, cont again, if I continue to Look at what's not there and what's negative, and I keep and I'm speaking that out. That is what our kids are going to pick up, and that's and I, it's, I see it. I see it in what they watch in TV. If that is what is being put out there, that's what my daughter starts to 
to show. And so just, again, everything that you, you are grateful showing that. Um, the discipline question, um, can you repeat that again? That part of the... Um, uh, discipline in a Christ-like manner. So uh, I've done quite a bit of parenting classes, and I actually have four books, or quite a few books that I've brought. And um, um, like Chris has said, just anything that you can gravitate to that you find. I mean, I'm just pull from lots of different sources. Um, the one that I'm really into right now is Loving Your Kids on Purpose by Danny Silk. And it is powerful because um, it really talks about how we are created and how God has created each of us in his image and uh, our children in their image and that um, that we get to focus, we get to give them freedom of choice and really choosing and disciplining, disciplining and walking alongside our children with choices and that that is what empowers them and giving good choices and that they can, um, and in, in that, is important that we have that heart-to-heart -heart connection because that's what God wants with us is that heart-to-heart -heart connection that no matter what we do and no matter what we say, he loves us unconditionally. So I would say that is for first and foremost is your heart. I mean, like we've talked about here, love, love, love. Love your child. Even when they're misbehaving, we're loving our children no matter what. And if our first response, and there are times when my first response is like that's like that goes to disrespect, if that's my first response, I need to back off. And um, so, again, with discipline, just like what I thought I said earlier, it's around noticing what, what's happening with me first, and that I'm calm, <laughs> and that I can breathe, and that I'm not rah, because we go to that fight, or I often, you know, or withdraw. And even that withdrawal is showing that, I, that your behavior is impacting me, and I can't handle it. And that's another piece of Danny Silk's work is that, um, is that I can handle your mistakes. You are not your mistakes, and I can handle that you're making mistakes. Um, and so it's, um, I'm trying to think if there's any pieces around that. And the importance of around just being, and with choices, it brings up empowerment of just of responsibility in choosing. And that's what we want our children to do is to make those choices for us, for themselves, so that when they grow up, they are responsible for those choices. That's awesome. There's also a book, recommend, uh, book recommendation. It's Emerson Egrich. He came and spoke here recently. Uh, it's called Mother and Son. It's really great about um, learning how to discipline your son in a respectful manner so that when he grows up, he looks for a wife that mm -hmm. he looks for respect. He understands what that looks like so that he doesn't go toward a woman that is, you know, degrading and insults him because you've modeled what that looks like. And I think that's really important as defining what respect. We use that word a lot. And so what does that look like? What are your words in saying that? So with anything with the children, it's defining what that looks like. And so, um, and so if you're interested, I have those books, quite a few books, but there's so much literature out there. It really is practicing. It's putting into practice. It's not just reading. It really is practicing. It, yeah, that's the hardest part is the practice. <laughs> reading, it's easy. <laughs> and sometimes there's some really funny wording that goes along with it. You're like, I can't say that, but it works. The next question is for Penny and Carissa. How do you separate Jesus and Santa? How do you make Christmas not about Santa? I get a fun question finally. Yeah. I'm glad. Um, this was an easy, easy distinction for our family. Um, we never really made a big deal about Santa. We treated it as a cultural fun thing. Um, and if we happened to be at the ball and there was Santa Claus there, then we would go stand in line and do all that. But, you know, if we didn't happen to run into one on a particular year, we skipped it. It, it just was, Santa was never a huge focus. Um, Veggie Tales makes a great video. If I wrote it down here, maybe I didn't. Oh, yeah. It's called St. Nicholas, the Story of Joyful Giving. And that is just an awesome video for um, kids to understand who St. Nicholas was. And it's just such a cool story. I just love it. Um, so what we did to make Christmas about Jesus um, 
was, were, there were several things. We would have a happy birthday Jesus party every year. Um, I was part of a pretty large play group when the kids were little, and we had a yearly tradition of decorating gingerbread houses and then having a birthday cake, and the whole focus was, was around Jesus, and, and that was a really fun tradition that my kids enjoyed um, in their littler years. And then we also had a Jesse tree. Are you all familiar with what that is? Anybody? Okay. So it's a separate little Christmas tree, and every night during Advent, you um, take an ornament, and the first one, for instance, is like, it's an apple with a little snake, and you talk about the story of Adam and Eve and the fall of man. And, through, and then you continue um, throughout the Bible, um, and of course the last one, is the birth of Jesus, and so you have special ornaments that designate different Bible stories. And it kind of just tells the whole story from beginning to end um, of our, our fall, our sinfulness, and how God's plan to redeem. And my kids loved that because the ornaments were hidden away, and they were really special ornaments. And so they would love to get that ornament out and put it on the tree and talk about the story. And that was one of my favorite things that we've done. Um, also shop for a family in need together. Um, we've done that before. We've delivered presents um, to a family who, families who don't have um, the ability to buy presents for each other. And that's been really special. Um, we actually limit presents on Christmas. We make birthdays a really big deal in our house. Birthdays, um, you get presents galore, and it's a super big celebration all about you. Christmas is reserved for Jesus, and we do give gifts, but it's not the focus. Um, and the last thing, let me see what else I have here. Um, we've always participated in church events um, geared toward the real, real meaning of Christmas. And so that could be anything from whatever, decorating ornaments together at church, or um, I find that churches have all these neat nativities and all of these things. And so just take advantage of that in our community. There's so many fun different things happening around Austin. And so that's, that's what we did. <laughs> Well, we were plenty shallow, and so we did Santa and Baby Jesus. <laughs> um, and what we did was we mainly, um, we talked about the fact that, um, you know, that Santa was the spirit of giving. Uh, we talked about St. Nicholas and, you know, that spirit of giving. But, again, we didn't make it a huge big deal. But when they were very little, uh, we would say, oh, you know, let's go see what Santa left you, you know, in your stockings. And that was exciting. And our kids reacted very differently about it. Our older daughter was just fine. She thought that was super fun. And then when she got old enough to say, now, who really does leave the presents? Because our deal was the minute they asked, we would tell them the truth. And so I'd say, well, actually, it was mommy and daddy, but we wanted you to think Santa was here, you know, because it's fun. And she's like, okay. Um, our second daughter, who is very linear and analytical and skeptical, um, she, she was different. She did not like that we had sort of played a trick on her. And she was, because she's the second child, she figured it out a lot quicker. And I think she was three and a half when she said, so what's the deal? Is this, are y'all really Santa? And we were like, yeah, we are. And then about two days later, she comes to me and she goes, okay, so, but what about God and Jesus? Are those real? And I was like, oh dear. And I said to her, well, Leah, yeah, Santa is just something we told you, but God and Jesus are real. And she goes, well, how do I know? I said, well, look at all the churches that are built and all the adults that get up every Sunday morning and get dressed and drive to church. I don't think they'd do that if they thought it was like Santa Claus. And I said, are you sorry that we let you think there was a Santa? And she goes, nah, it was kind of fun. And I said, okay. Um, little did we know that when she went to her three and a half year old preschool that she was going to burst the bubble and we got a call <laughs> because there were some very traumatized firstborns. Um, I probably should have mentioned that that was not something we share. We let other parents tell other children. So she was, yeah, the bubble burster. Um, but I think I told you this last year. One of the things that we loved to do was recite the Christmas story. And I would recite it to them at night before they went to bed. And 
and we have video of Meredith at three saying, okay, mommy, now I'm going to say it to you. And there were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field. And she did the whole Luke 2 uh, Christmas story from memory before she was four. And you, it, it, at that point, it amazed. I, I got the amazing power of of what you can impart to young children. Their little brains are just so agile, and so I began reciting poetry and you know reading stories and Bible verses to my kids. And it is shocking how a, how much a kid under the age of ten can memorize. Uh, so you know, grab that window of time. Thanks. Yeah, I recently had my four-year-old ask me if she could pray to Santa her wish list. So Ooh. we're just where I'm starting to <laughs> go through this talk now. About it. Yeah. <laughs> no, you can't pray to Santa. Okay, we have <laughs> we have one more question. It's for Jolie and Stephanie, and then our last question will be a quick collective answer with all the mentors. So, how do you efficiently ma- manage your days, i.e., staying in the Word, taking care of yourself, family, kids, balancing life? As as a Christian grounded in God's word. What are some routines you put in place to help with laundry day, waking up early, food prep, etc.? <laughs> That's a long one. Um, it depends, honestly, in the season of life that I'm, I've been in, um, because one thing I've learned as being a mom and now a Mimi is to, honestly, you have to take time to breathe. Like, you cannot help others unless you help yourself. They say it for a reason on the airplane, to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on your own child or someone in need. Um, So something I've just learned is that um, this is like a fun thing that I've made a part of our life since our kids were little. Uh, Some people, you know, start the week going, they're frustrated or um, you're agitated because it's just a busy week. But something I've had to do for myself is on Sundays, um, I open up my calendar and I'm old school because we didn't have, like we had pagers when our sons were little. So I don't do the phone so much and putting in a calendar because the reminders would be binging at me all the time, you know? So um, I do the old school way of the calendar. I'm happy to share with you what it looks like. Um, But I, on Sunday or even Saturday, will look at the next week and I'll kind of plan out my week. Just because if I don't do that, it can be Wednesday and there's things that I had to get done um, that aren't done and then I could, you know, be in a pressure cooker. Um, I'm in a season right now that I am working, you know, to help where we are financially. Um, So I work every day and to be able to manage the schedule that we have uh, and writing it down, I do color code. So meaning um, I have highlighters, green is my work, um, uh, pink is my personal, blue is, you know, anything church related or being at church, yellow is family. So those are my four core things. Um, And so for me to look at the next week and just see, oh my gosh, I'm working way too much or, um, you know, I don't have any pink in there, which I have to have pink because that's my personal, you know, fill me up time. Um, So that's just something that I've gotten in a routine about. And the the interesting thing is, is that my son, who's 20 years old, um, he works and he owns his own business and goes to school and he does this calendar method um, to balance his life. I didn't try to teach it to him. He's just grown up to see how it worked and now he incorporates it to be able to balance um, his life and have fun at the same time Um, because whatever we create in our home and it's always stressful or chaotic or we're running around that's what we'll teach our children Um, and I say that just because I've gone through those waves of learning that I don't want to do that like whenever I've tried to do it all on my own Um, so with that being said, having time with God, that's just been different seasons. Whenever our second son had RSV and was sick all the time with asthma, I would pray all the time, sing praises because I'd be holding him. And so I felt like my time with God just really grew during a not so fun time that, you know, we couldn't go a lot of places physically, like, but spiritually it grew in a way that I, I miss sometimes because with the schedule I have right now, um, I pray without ceasing. So I'm, I'll sing praises to the Lord on the way here or in the shower, or I'll take a, a quick moment in the morning. It's just because of where I am. I don't beat myself up about it because there's been times where I've had two hours in a morning um, prior to my husband not 
having a job and have all that time with God. I feel like God just wants time with you, period. Um, so in the car or one of the times when I had to be one of the moms that wait, would wait um, at the carpool line, I would always have a Bible with me and a devotion. And so, mind you, we had pagers, so we didn't have the cell phone um, back then. But I would, you know, open up the devotion, you know, put the car in park, roll down the window, spend that time in God's Word, just because that's the time I had at that moment in my life. Um, and then, you know, the making time for you is, you know, when I say that's so important is if you need to have a, a girlfriend time just to laugh and go paint or meet up with her to have Starbucks, you know, if you put that in your routine, it, it will happen. You know, if you don't, it, it's not. So that's how we do our dates with the kids is plugging it in. I have one with the older ones one time a month and Hannah, cause she's younger. I used to usually try to have more one-on-one -on -one time obviously with her um, now, like, you know, because she's so young. Um, let's see, what was another part of that question? Because it was so long. Uh, what are some routines? Yeah, it was uh, just taking care of yourself, oh. the family, and the kids, and balancing life Christ as Christian grounded in God. Okay. And so with, with the laundry and us cooking dinner, one of the things that we do is we always try to do, especially in the fall and winter, we do crock pot meals on Sunday. So um, we put together something so that way we can make multiple things out of it in the week or we freeze some of it so it's there for meal preparation um, because I don't have every night to be able to... Um, to prepare food and, and to eat out for, you know, a family of our size, it would cost a lot. So we do have to, um, you know, prepare in advance. And, and so I've learned how to freeze things or I'm really into that Pinterest now where it gives you all the recipes and I take snapshots and then I actually send it to my husband and ask if he can go to the grocery store on the way home. But just mind you, when you do that, send the uh, how to make it part two because then you can leave something out and so he's like send the whole thing to me next time <laughs> so um but anyways it's all about you know asking for help too and the beginning of being a new mommy I didn't really ask for a whole lot of help I thought I could do it all and then by asking my older son to help can you just be the sock sorter um you know ask you know the other son I just need you to unload or load the dishwasher and so funny thing is is my oldest who's married she always is complimenting saying you know he'll just wash the clothes or you you know, wash the dishes, and I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus, you know, because it helps her not having to do everything, and now with, uh, you know, two-year-old and a baby on the way, you're training, you know, your children, so that way they're not marrying a woman that feels like I am so drained, but they're helping, um, so that's just something to know that you're always preparing them, as Julie says, launching them, and so when you're preparing them to do that, God's blessing them and you because you're you're doing a great job, um, so whenever you feel like you, you just can't do it anymore, it's okay, just, I remember going around just saying, you know, Lord, help me, you know, Lord, just, just because of where, you know, just feeling tired, if you have extra 15 minutes and you have little ones, take a nap, take a power nap, um, if you can take a back a bath at night to relax, do that. But make sure you are, you know, making sure you're taking care of yourself so you can pour out onto others and, and that way everybody gets filled up. That was great. I agree with a lot of what Jolie said. Um, she covered a lot of uh, the same things I was going to say. Specifically, um, the question asked, how do you efficiently manage your day? Uh, staying in the Word, I would tell you, I have been good at that at times and really bad at it at times. Um, but what I've found is that when I'm really bad at it, Satan beats me up for it. And then I sort of spiral down. And so don't do that. Um, just get better, right? And if you have determined that you want to spend time in the Word, figure out a, a time of day that works for you. And they say if you do something 21 days in a row, it's a habit. So the 21 days, gird your loins, ladies, it's going to be hard. But after 21 days, it gets easier. And if you miss a day, don't oh, throw up your hands and be done. Just get back on track. And you don't have to read four chapters a day or an entire book of the Bible a day. You can read one verse. Mm -hmm. And God can roll that around in your heart and in your mind. And he can feed you and he can teach you. And you've been in God's word. And God's going to make the most of that time that you spend. And, and um, just, just keep getting back into it. Um, 
the question asked about managing your days. Uh, you guys have heard me talk before about doing a prayer journal with my kids, and part of what I prayed every day that my kids heard me pray was, um, Lord, order my day. And um, homeschooling for kids and uh, running two volunteer programs and all the things that I had going on. There were days I just, my day was, was running me, and, um, and I, I didn't like those days. And so I felt like when I started my day praying that, that God was really faithful and helped me order my day, and the end of the day was much better on those days than, than if I didn't start there. Um, something else was uh, taking care of yourself. When I had littles, um, the only time I could work out was leaving the house at 5.30 in the morning. I went and did a class. Classes motivate me because I'm competitive. And um, I could do that and be back home before Alan had to leave for work. Otherwise, I was not getting a workout in. And so um, that's what I did for years and years and years, and it worked. And um, yes, I was tired a lot of afternoons. And when my kids were little, I rarely took a nap when they were napping because I thought I needed to get more stuff done. And the truth is, I should have taken the nap. So um, take the nap. You can sleep for 20 minutes and be refreshed, and you can still get stuff done. And you're probably going to be more efficient getting stuff done if you go ahead and take that nap. Um, than if you don't. And I would really encourage you to pray. Um, you know, I think sometimes we get in our heads, we've got to have the prayer closet, or we've got to have the prayer this or the prayer that. No, we can pray all the time, like Julie talked about, praying without ceasing. And we need to be in communication with the Lord. And I did not have little kids and a cell phone. And there are times that would have been super convenient, but there are also tons of times that that would have been distracting. And um, I would encourage you ladies to put the phone down. There's there's rarely something that's so urgent that you need to have that with you all the time. And it's going to suck away your time with God. It's going to suck away your time with your kids. And, um, and you, can, you can look at Pinterest and Facebook and Instagram and, and all those great things that really are fun and, and, um, and, and can be joyful, but they can wait. They don't need to be right now. And, um, and I'd encourage you to put that down. Laundry, I'm cracking up, as my, the ladies at my table know. I'm compulsive about laundry. I do it every Monday. Why? Because my mom did it every Monday. And um, I... I'm almost done with laundry today. It's Monday. And so, um, but that worked for me. And I would encourage you guys, if you can do it like that, it's fabulous. Everybody, all of their clothes are clean Monday night. And from the time my kids were little, um, if they could walk, they could bring their, their dirty clothes. Once they can tell colors, they can sort laundry. Uh, a house that we lived in in Tulsa, we had this um, sort of bridge and then this big brass chandelier, yeah. And um, my, my girls would stand up and throw their laundry over. I can't tell you how many times I had to get the broom handle to get panties off of the chandelier, <laughs> right? Um, I think they were maybe aiming for it, but, um, but, but they can help, they can participate in that. My kids have known how to do laundry um, from a very, very early age, but you know, it's what we do on Mondays and they know, and at the end of the day, everybody takes their folded clothes to the room and has to put them away. And um, that's just the way it works. My, my kids have all gone to college now, and every single one of them had said to, have said to me, I can't believe my roommate doesn't know how to do laundry. <laughs> Ladies, don't let somebody say that about your kid. Yeah. They can help you with laundry right now. And I know you can do it faster by yourself, but but get the kids in there. It organizes your day. And, and for me, doing laundry on Mondays, it was a routine. And my kids knew, um, my ladies at my table know, I get my laundry done on Mondays. And even when I'm busy and I'm gone and, and whatever, I still get it done. Um, sometimes you do have to get up early in the morning. That was, um, you know, waking up early, doing food prep. When, I, um, when, when everybody was home and the kids were little and I cooked spaghetti, I did a quadruple recipe and I, I freeze the rest of it so I have it for another meal. Um, anytime I could double or triple or quadruple a recipe, I would do that. But it also gave me the chance then if somebody was sick or ill, I had a freezer meal I could bring to somebody at the drop of a hat and, um, and that helped me. If you're one of those people who can sit down and plan out your menu for the week, do that. That's a huge time saver. The few times I've done it, it was fabulous. I don't think well like that, so I didn't do it all the time, but the times that I did it, that was, that was a huge thing um, for me. And, and sometimes, ladies, we have to get out of bed early. And, and I, I like my sleep. I really don't like getting up before that first number's a seven. And the truth is, I don't know the last time I got to stay in bed until then, but when I'm up early in the morning and the rest of the house is asleep, 
dang, I get a lot done. You know, I don't have kids or phones or people or, or whatever interrupting me, and I'm super efficient. And there are, just, there are just times you need to do that, and it may just be a season of life where you are up early to have your time with the Lord, to have, have a few minutes to read the Word, to plan out that grocery list, um, to get your day in order. And I would encourage you to do that. It's, it's not forever. Um, I don't know when exactly I'll sleep in, but um, I think now I'm wired to get up, but I think that, um, that there are ways to order your time. And the first thing I would tell you really is... Um, your phone is going to slow you down, and it's going to it's going to make you less organized, not more organized. Awesome. An HEB in the checkout line has a fall seasons fix it and leave it crock pot magazine right now, and it's really good. I've been making my breakfast like or my dinners at like nine in the morning lately. It's very helpful if y'all go to HEB. Last question is for everybody. Just a quick answer. What is the number one thing you each feel is most important to do for yourself? each day on a regular basis. I love this one. Um, And pretty much they've covered it, but I actually started making a list of all the things that everybody tells us we need to do. Personally, we should exercise, drink enough water, brush and floss, get enough protein and vegetables, get enough sleep, take vitamins, moisturize and use sunscreen, maintain your hair and clothes, read and keep up with current events, be cognizant of your mental health and manage your stress levels. In the household, you want clean floors, bathrooms, beds and linens, dusting, laundry, budgeting and bill paying. Get the mail and sort it, and that doesn't even include pets and yard. Meals, plan, shop, prep, serve and clean up. Family, keep up the bonds with the in-laws and extended family members. You're responsible for making holidays and birthdays important. Marriage, keep dating, spend quality time with him, communicate, be a sexy wife with him, and laugh. Spiritually, prayer and time in the word, being a friend to those who need me, and keeping up quality friendships. Nuclear family, telling family members you love them and showing it with hugs and kisses often. Teaching, training, discipline, and building character in your kids. Refereeing, telling them about Jesus and praying with them. Making good family memories and having fun together. Not happening. (laughs) So what I do is I say, Lord, help me to prioritize my day your way. This is my target. I shoot for it every day. And we hit what we hit, and what we don't get, we don't get. So I would say pray and ask the Lord to help you set priorities and be kind to yourself. Because at the end of the day, if you've had some fun, that's what your kids are going to remember anyway. And here's what I told our kids. We're going to make mistakes because we're winging it. We're doing the best we can. But I can tell you that Daddy and I do not lie awake at night trying to ruin your lives. <laughs> As a matter of fact, every mistake, we, everything we've done for you has been out of love and or ignorance. Okay? And if you just keep telling your kids, we didn't know any better, we did the best we could, please be kind. It's funny now as they're grown, they're like, yeah, we know you. We didn't, we didn't agree with that, but we knew you loved us and you were trying. <laughs> so buy yourself an out early on. But be kind to yourselves. Okay, what's the question? (laughs) I lost it. What is the number one thing you each feel is most important for you to do for yourself every day on a regular basis? For myself. Okay, well, definitely spend time in the Word of God. Every morning, that's, that's where you can find me. But at the end of my day... I take a bath every single night, and it doesn't matter if we've gone out and we get home super late or whatever time it is, I always do this, and I'll be in there for up to an hour, and I read or I sleep or I whatever. I I don't even know what I do, but it is my um, just, it just fills me up completely. So that is something that I am very faithful with. Um, For me, it's, there's two things. One is I really, the big one is worship. I just, I got to put music on and I just need to praise God and worship. That will adjust my mindset for everything. If I don't do that, it's very rare that I don't do that. Um, Then I'm just not, I'm just not a nice person. And so it just really helps my mindset and putting God first and praising him. And then, um, And these come in different orders. It could be worship first and then surrender, but I'm on my knees and I'm really my whole body and I am surrendering before the Lord again, just to hope to make sure that it's his, it's his kingdom come, his will be done, not my own. For me, it's, um, I'm very verbal. So for me, it's important to me that I talk to God and, um, 
and I pretty much open my eyes and have words. And so uh, I start talking to God first thing in the morning, and it's really important to me that I talk to my husband every day. So if he's traveling or if he has a really busy day or whatever, um, he knows he knows I'm a, I'm a much more sane woman if, if he can give me a quick call, and it may only be 60 seconds, but um, I talk to him, so that's really important to me. Um, like Stephanie said earlier, it takes 21 days to start and break a habit. And so one of the things I'd encourage you to do is that um, you had a life, too, before you had children and got married. So you have fun things that make you happy, you. So what it might be read a book. It might be take a bath. It might be just that you need to go take a walk and talk to God. Um, whatever it is. Uh, make that list, and it could be three things. It could be ten. Um, I would say, you know, stick to ten and under. But every day, if you need to get in the habit of looking at that list and go, you know, I'm going to pick this for myself today, right, on sticky notes and put it on your mirror before you go to bed so that way you make sure you did that one thing so that way you're recharged to get up the next day and be like, ooh, what am I going to do for myself today? Um, Because like I said, it's so hard to take care of our kids and our husband and everybody if we didn't do maybe that one thing that was a fun thing or um, laughter is really big to me so always it's um, I don't know I have to I find something that makes me laugh every day um, I just even talking to my son Colton he just is an instant like he can just make me laugh so laughter is just something I have to do every day and obviously you know talking to God um, but that's mine mine's laughter um, it takes four times as many muscles to frown it is I don't know how to do it. Then it does to smile and to laugh, and I think God gave us the, the gift of laughter, and so if I can find something to laugh at, I have a group of friends, and we just give each other cards from the um, car wash, because they're hilarious. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be your birthday or whatever, it's just like, look at this card, oh my gosh. And it's just that kind of thing, just to be fun, or call a friend and just have some fun conversation on the phone, and then even you know, together, when Robert and I are together, it's always something to laugh about. Especially if it's, oh, look at this bill. They sent us another note. Look how much they love us. Look, let's put it with the other ones. Isn't that fun? And when they match, then we'll pay you. So just things like that of finding ways to, um, to balance the day. Um, and then again, with grandbabies around, there's, how can you not laugh? Um, even when they pee on you or whatever, it's still just so funny. Like, oh, good arch. You know, that was funny. So um, anyway, it is just laughter because I just know that when I'm laughing, God's laughing with me. He laughs at me. And I know a lot of times he's just like, oh, no. But anyway, I just like enjoy laughing. Um, there's not a lot left for me to add. So um, the biggest thing that I really try to do every day, truthfully, uh, is play. Mm-hmm. Take time to play. Yeah. Let's give these mentors a big round of applause. Thank you guys for helping raise us up as women and wives and friends and moms and everything. You guys are really great. We're very thankful for you guys.